Ciao, buongiorno, buonasera, good morning, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Thanks for joining us. I'm Katie, the founder of Untold Italy, a podcast, small group tour company, and online resource for planning independent trips to Italy and host of the Italy Travel Planning Community on Facebook. With me today is Danielle Oteri from Feast Travel and our follower, Laura, who's planning a trip to Italy in the coming months. Now, every day at Untold Italy, we help thousands of travellers from all over the world plan their dream trip to Italy through independent research, but sometimes it can be a bit overwhelming. There's just a ton of a ton of information and websites and offerings out there, and I know many of you are short on time and wish someone could give you informed answers based on their deep experience so that you can have the most amazing trip to Italy ever, the one that you've actually dreamed of. Now, earlier this year, we conducted a live trip consultation with one of our followers, conducted by Danielle here from Feast Travel, uh, who offer Italy travel planning services. This session was so popular that we've decided to make it a regular feature on all of our channels. So that includes our podcast, YouTube channel and our Facebook group. So Danielle is back today to help Laura and Ed. Ed is here too. Hi, Ed. Plan her upcoming trip and uh, give you an insight into what it's like to hire a trip planner who has a ton of experience assisting people traveling in Italy. Danielle Bentonata, welcome back. Could you please introduce yourself and tell everyone about your background and experience? Thank you, Katie. Um, yeah, I'm the founder of Peace Travel, where we host group tours and we do itinerary consultations and custom itineraries and planning. My love and my passion is really South Italy. That's where my roots are. Uh, my business partner and who's also my family. And um, I'm before that an art historian. I worked for the medieval branch of the Metropolitan Museum of Art for 15 years. And so history is a special, always has a special place in my heart, um, as well as food and wine. I also run a food tour company based in New York City called Arthur Avenue Food Tours. So bringing together all of my nerdy interests, my professional experience, and my big appetite. Uh, we usually try to do a, a good job to advise people on the best places to go in Italy. Oh, uh, well, Danielle, it's always, always a pleasure to have you on board. And let me just, it's always a pleasure to have Danielle here. And she's appeared many times on our podcast. Basically, you know, we've got a lot of things in common a love for food, a love for Italy, a love for travel and history and art. So it's been a it's been a wonderful experience working with Danielle. Now I'm also joined by Laura and Ed, and they're planning their trip to Italy. So I'm just going to uh, ask you to introduce yourselves and let us know a little bit about your trip and what you have hoped for your trip and maybe what the motivations were for planning a trip like this. So I'm just going to put that over to you. My name is Laura. This is my husband, Ed. We live in Knoxville, Tennessee. We have two boys, um, 23 and 26. Uh, the 26 year old is moving to New York City next week. Um, we are just, we're kind of foodies. I guess he, um, he likes to smoke meat. We like to cook together. We like to have people over. It's always been kind of his dream to go to Italy, um, but we just really have not much uh, knowledge about traveling in Italy. We kind of know what we don't want to do more than we, more than anything else. Okay. Mm, okay. All right. I'm going to um, put Danielle on now. So let's just. There we go now. There she goes. There we go. There's Danielle. Okay, off you go. All right. So the way I like to do these consultations is, yeah, we'll talk a little bit more about your trip, what it is you want to get out of it. Being you don't know, you know what you don't want, that's actually probably a pretty good place to start. And then we'll work through some ideas. Now, one of the reasons that when um, I was looking through the Excel spreadsheet of the people who submitted their itineraries to be considered for this was one of the most common things that I saw. And I, you know, I wanted to pick something that would answer as many questions as possible was overwhelmed by the information. I saw so many people who probably throughout the pandemic have been listening to Katie's podcast, which is a great source of information, um, reading blog posts, maybe looking at TikTok, which was not such good information. <laughs> and so, TikTok, so there we go. Yeah, it seems like it seems like information overload is one of your challenges as well. But why don't we get started with um, so first, this is your first trip to Italy, right? Correct. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. Okay. And what don't, as you said, what don't you want from this trip? Let's start there. I don't want to go to Rome. I want to, want to go to Rome. I want to <laughs> see the people in the countryside and experience the the country. And I love history, but I don't want to be in a crowd like don't that. Don't want to be in a crowd. Okay. I'm going to traipse from museum to museum. I do not want to do that. I okay. want, to, want to see the so, people. So here, here's, can I give you a little conversation bit that we had? He said, I said, uh, what do you want your trip to look like? And he said, I want to go to a little town and I want an Italian grandma to teach me how to cook Italian food. And I was like, well, I don't really know how to schedule the Italian grandma for you, but <laughs> that's kind of what, you know. And when uh, Katie talked about Arezzo one time and she said, um, it, you might be hard pressed to find someone that speaks English there. And I thought, oh, that sounds like a good place to go. Maybe a little bit problematic, but I mean, so that, I mean, I don't know if that helps, but that's yeah. more what we're looking for. More of like an embedding in an area than to run around all over Italy. Okay. How many different kind, different places would you want to see? Do you have, like, do you want to stay in one place the entire time, unpack your bags once, or do you want to move around to a few different places? Um, well, I mean, we plan on getting a car so we can go day trips and do stuff. And um, I, I think we would maybe want to be two or three nights at least in one place before we moved on. Like okay. in my mind, and I don't know if this is, but in my mind, for instance, we would, this is what we only thing we thought of so far is flying to Florence, spend the night, get your bearings, get your car, whatever, go to Arezzo and stay there for two or three days and use that kind of as a base for, visiting maybe some smaller local wineries or something like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Or towns, I don't know. And do you want to stay in Tuscany for the, how, how long is, how long do you have altogether? Two weeks. Two weeks? Mm -hmm. And you want to stay in, do you want to stay in Tuscany the entire time? I mean, that's kind of what we thought, but, um, you know, we don't, we wouldn't have to. If, I mean, I would kind of like to see the we, coast. We could fly to Croatia for a night. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't mind to see a coastal area. He's not okay. super keen on it, but I do think I would like to, if it's not too far. To get out of the coastal coast okay. area. And so cooking with a grandma, lots of good food, lots of good wine, small town where you can embed with the locals, um, maybe some beach, maybe some coast. And what you're planning on leaving in October, is that the idea? Uh, if our passports get back. <laughs> no, this is it's it's starting to feel too last minute. So we could always punt to spring if we have to. Okay. So for the for those who are watching or listening, um, Laura, let us know before that their passports have not yet arrived. So it's possible this trip may not happen this fall. But if it does happen, it would happen in October, right? Right. Yes. Late October. Late October. Okay. So the good news is. Late October of this year is great. This summer has just been incredibly busy and popular and, you know, I mean, <laughs> overwhelming crowds everywhere. And I'm, you know, I'm hearing stories of people, even in, you know, strange, unusual places for American tourists or non-European tourists, it's been busy. Yeah. Um, and I'm hearing from, except for the Cinque Terre, which in October is still beyond, beyond, beyond packed. <laughs> it seems that many places, uh, are fairly fairly available. So October is a great month to travel. It's a great month to travel anyway, because the weather is gorgeous and it's cool and you still get warm days and cool nights and the, it's, the, it's the harvest. So all of those wonderful things. All right. So, you know, for sure, after listening to the podcast with Katie, Arezzo is one of your mm -hmm. destinations, right? All right. So for sure in Arezzo, and you, and you said you're comfortable driving a car, right? Mm hmm Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So well, in Ireland, on if, the wrong side of the road. If so. I can drive <laughs> over after overnight trip in Ireland on the wrong side of the road, we can go before Google. Good. So uh, you know, there, there's a few things here that I'm going to just just say that might not be specific to your situation, but just because I know that these are questions that other people have. In general, when you go to Tuscany, 
you really need to rent a car. Um, some people go to Tuscany to rent a villa and be with their friends and family and just like check out and have, you know, maybe some day trips planned. But if you want to explore the Tuscan countryside, you need to rent a car. Uh, the exception would be is if you're planning a specific vineyard day and you know that you want to really enjoy drinking, then you might want to book a driver for that night or, you know, stay at, stay at a winery, that sort of thing. Because uh, the Tuscan Hills, while not as, you know, they're figuratively rolling. They're not um, like some of the other places in Italy where they're really the GPS start stops working because the hills are so dramatic. Still, you don't want to be driving those even if you've had some wine, <laughs> just even just a little bit of wine. So that's great. Um, and I definitely recommend when you rent your car to rent it outside of the city. So you said flying into Florence, rent the car. Even if you stay in Florence for a day or two, rent the car at the airport. Yeah. So that you don't have to drive in Florence. <laughs> Is that a good place to fly into? Is that a good choice? It's a very small airport, so you might not find many options there. Uh, Pisa is a slightly bigger airport. If you're coming from Knoxville, I would imagine you're probably flying to somewhere on the East Coast, like New York or Boston, and then transferring. Um, so usually Pisa is the bigger airport. There are some flights that go into Florence, but it's tiny. It's funny. You feel like you're being let off by the school bus when you get off in Florence. <laughs> you know, like they drop you off, you walk off the plane across the tarmac. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, like <laughs> the, the major international airports are Milan and Rome. Um, Naples has a, is a smaller airport, but there are some like international flights that go in there. And there are, there are others around Italy, but yeah, generally Milan and Rome are the big international airports. So that, you know, that also may be a factor in pricing as well. If you do have to fly into Rome, we're not gonna make you go to Rome because you said you don't want to. <laughs> but if you have to, say for example, you get a really great flight, you yeah. can take the fast train, what's called the Freccia Rosa, um, from Rome to Florence. And it's about, I believe an hour and 45 minutes. Okay. So that would be worth so, it if the price was way better. Yeah, just because and, you might, and you you might want to take the transfers. I'm sorry? You take the train from the you airport. You can catch it from the airport. Yeah, so the way, there's a really fantastic shuttle service from the Rome airport to the Rome train station called the Leonardo Express. And it's like 15 euro, it runs every 25 minutes. So, and you don't have to buy a ticket ahead of time. Whenever you arrive, you follow the, the signs for the Leonardo Express, you take the train, uh, there's a good coffee bar right after you buy your tickets. <laughs> you get your first coffee in Italy. <laughs> you have your first Cornetto. Um, and then you'll be within, you know, I think it's about a 25 minute ride into the main Rome train station. And that's where you can get all the train lines. There's the Italo train, train Italia, but Freccia Rosa is the fast train. Um, also a good tip. There is a hotel outside of the Rome airport that is also a spa. It's really nice. So what do we say for people that are like returning, if you need to stay near the airport, like there is a, like a Marriott and whatever, like in the airport itself, you know, if your flight's at four in the morning, but there's also a spa airport. So if you need to like have that first night to sleep it off and get a massage, mm -hmm. you can go there as well. And then you could actually pick up a car at the Rome airport and drive north to Tuscany. And I would say also getting a car at the Rome airport and then drive, since you're comfortable driving, um, north to Tuscany would be a great option as well, because along the way, especially in southern Tuscany, there's a lot of really beautiful towns to see. Okay. So um, how about we talk about some of those other Tuscan towns that you might see? I mean, with Arezzo, we know, and it's beautiful, and you can go see the, uh, the, the Piero della Francesca frescoes there and satisfy the art history um, requirement of going to Italy without having to actually go to a museum. You can see this beautiful cycle of paintings inside of a church. But I want to mention some of the other towns in Tuscany that I think are really worth a visit. And okay. can see they're of interest to you since you're wide open right now. Mm -hmm. um, one would be is if you're if you're driving south uh, or if you're driving north from Rome. Okay. Um, there's a town called Saturnia. It's pretty well known. It's a town where there's this whole series of hot springs, natural thermal hot springs, and you can pull off the side of the road and jump in if you want, which I did when I was much younger. <laughs> you can you can go to a, a proper like sort of a beach club um, and then there's a spa and there's a hotel there as well where you can go and they have a beautiful restaurant and you can enjoy the hot springs. 
So Saturnia is a really wonderful place. Um, Monte Pulciano, of course, is very, very famous for wine. And that's a place where I know in particular, what I'll do after this call, just, just so everybody knows too, on these itinerary consultation calls, you know, we sort of talk through different ideas. And then afterwards, I send you a document that has the names and the specific phone numbers and, and the, you know, resources so that you can go plan this afterwards. And you're not like, how do I spell that? I don't speak Italian. But I, I do know one uh, a woman named Pamela Sheldon Jones who has an, a home. She's an American who's been living in Tuscany for 20, 30 years. And she has an olive oil farm in Tuscany, in, near Monte Pulciano, and it's gorgeous. And she has some rooms to stay. It's very simple. It's not a fancy resort or anything like that. But she's a cookbook author, beautiful farm, olive harvest. Olive harvest will probably be over by October, but it's a real chance to see real Tuscany with people who obviously speak fluent English because they're originally Americans. That sounds really great. Yeah. So I will send you her contact information for her place, which is called Pojo e Trasco. Um, further north in Tuscany, this would be almost to Florence, maybe just an hour, it's about an hour outside of Florence. There's a town called San Miniato, and there you'll find two, two things in particular that are really wonderful. So first of all, San Miniato is a town that's on this pilgrimage route, this ancient pilgrimage route that went to Rome called the Via Francigena. And I, I, I will spell that for everybody's benefit because it probably just sounded like I sneezed. Uh, F-R-A-N-C-I-G-E-N-A. -E so people may be familiar with the famous Santiago de Compostela, the pilgrimage route to Spain. Mm -hmm. But in Italy, it was the Via Francigena. And there's actually a lot of people now because Santiago de Compostela is such a crowded, over-touristed pilgrimage. A lot of people are doing this one. So San Miniato in the Middle Ages was one of these pilgrimage stops. And um, there's a beautiful medieval tower there, a small medieval center of the town. But there's a winery there called Pietro Becconcini. It's family owned, Tuscan family. And it's the, the vineyard is situated on an ancient seabed. So when you walk around the grounds, you pick up, there's just millions of these tiny little nautiluses in the ground from when this was a, a prehistoric seabed. So it's this beautiful place. It's got this fascinating history in the ground itself. And then Ava and uh, Leonardo who run it are just lovely people. This is, this is a much more, you know, there's, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of wineries in Tuscany that are similar to the experience that you might have like in Napa Valley in California where, you know, if anybody's ever seen that movie Sideways, where, where the bus pulls up and there's just people drinking bad wine, <laughs> there's a lot of that for sure. This is like the family that they live in the house. You'll have a tasting inside the house. Their one-eyed cat will be running around. The kid is there. It's a real true experience. So when you said you want to embed with real people and get to know. It's definitely more like what we're looking for. Yeah. This would be a great place. And what's so interesting and why I bring up the, the whole pilgrimage path is they also have a wine there that's a Tempranillo, which is a wine from Spain, a grape from Spain, I should say. And they found it growing feral in their vineyard because it was brought by the monks in the Middle Ages as they were pilgrims from Spain. So it's one of these places where like history and food and wine and beautiful people and the Tuscan landscape, you know, everything that looks like an olive oil ad kind of clicks together. That sounds good. <laughs> My husband is a sommelier and loves this wine is in the background. <laughs> right? if I'm in. <laughs> well, we could bring him in later if you want to talk more about it. <laughs> well, don't tell him that we bought our Italian wine from the grocery store tonight. So <laughs> don't even know what it is. <laughs> All right, so let me keep going with some more options. So we got Monte Pulciano, of course. We have Saturnia. We have uh, San Miniato. And then another town that I really like is called Pietra Santa. And it's closest to Lucca. It's a small, beautiful town that, uh, you know, like all of Tuscany, a beautiful walled medieval village. And it's very close to the Carrara Marble Caves where Michelangelo used to source his marble. And one of the cool things you can do in that area also is do a Jeep tour of the Carrara Mar Marble Caves, which 
you know, Katie and I have this running thing that we always like to scratch the Indiana Jones itch. You definitely feel that if you do one of those Jeep tours. But the city of Pietra Santa itself has a ton of uh, sculptors and bronze workers and just a lot of contemporary artists. So it's another place where it has a deep medieval and Renaissance history, but there are all these contemporary artists that live there as well. And there's art all over the city. There are installations. We saw that on TV, it looked amazing. It, yeah, it's really amazing. And it doesn't seem to be that there, I mean, there's tourism there, but not as much as you see in Cortona, you know, the places that are very, very famous. But Pietra Santa is beautiful. And I really feel like a lot of Tuscany can sometimes feel kind of precious. And a lot of the history can be sort of overwhelming. Like people will say to you, wow, Charles VIII was here. And, you know, most Americans are going to be like, great. Is he related to George Washington? Like, who's that? <laughs> Uh, you know, Tuscan and Tuscans are very proud, rightfully so, about their history, but it can like be a little dry at times if you're not deeply familiar with it. Mm -hmm. Even for me, having studied it, I went to graduate school in Florence, even sometimes I'm like, okay. But um <laughs> Santa is a place where like art is still being made, it's still vibrant and and you can be part of that experience. And there's some fantastic restaurants there, some actually more high-end places. So okay. You can certainly have, you know, lots of more rustic meals in all of these places. But if you want to go out for a really nice dinner, there's a couple of higher end restaurants in Pietra Santa that I would recommend. Awesome. All right. So how does that all sound to you? That sounds great. Um, I had kind of looked into a few uh, cooking school, like, I don't know if you call it a school, but cooking experiences where you kind of stay in one place for a couple of days and you do some cooking with some other people. Is that, do you think that's a good option? It depends on how deep you want to go. There's a lot of different kinds of cooking classes in Italy in general. Uh, there, you know, there's some that where people will come to your house. There's some where people will really dig into like one specific kind of food. Um, Generally, if you have, if there's a connection to you know, somebody in particular, sorry, my dog is playing with a squeak toy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> my husband's going to intercept. <laughs> um, <laughs> murdering a squeak toy. The, well, I lost my train of thought. Um, there are also, you know, sort of like more easy drop in, drop off cooking schools like so for example in the central market in Florence there's a cooking school that's on the top level you have to have a reservation and know when the class schedule is but I, I feel like that's you know if you have a casual interest and mm -hmm. you want to just do like a day of cooking you want to learn how to make some pasta or some regional dish you can do something like that or you can um, go a little bit deeper I usually like to send people who are interested in cooking to a woman I know named Judy Francini who is also an American but has lived in Tuscany for I forget, since the, since the 80s. And she used to run a cooking school inside the Central Market, which she closed, but she still is just able to connect people with all sorts of chefs around Tuscany and to do things either out in the countryside or in Florence or to do market tours. And because she is a cooking teacher, you know, she can really meet you at your level. So if, if cooking is of a big interest, then, you know, finding somebody local who, who really knows what they're doing and it's not just sort of like a rote activity is definitely right. worthwhile. Okay. There's, you know, the harvest season, of course, in Tuscany is, is fantastic. Um, and, you know, some of the, I feel like when you go anywhere, you take a, a cooking class. Like if you're going to, if you're going to make pizza, like take that, if you want to make pizza, take that class in Naples. If you want to do pasta, you know, Bologna is probably the best place to do it. So I would sort of think about the kind of food that you like and you can integrate that, you know, the best place for you to do that. Mm -hmm where you end up during your trip. Is, is there something in particular in mind that you have? No, I think we're just, we just are open to that type of experience. We love to cook and we love to try new foods and we like to have people in mm -hmm. and cook together and stuff like that. So I think almost anything really would be. Yeah, in Tuscany, it's great to do, certainly it's, um, it's a little more meat heavy in Tuscany. Steak being most <laughs> he smokes meat. That's his thing. Okay. <laughs> I am. So all right. So so then you also want to go to Panzano, and th this is a very very well known place. But it it is indeed wonderful, even though it is very famous. Panzano is a place where the famous Tuscan butcher 
Dario Cecchini is based. And he, he's been on lots of different travel shows. He's been on Anthony Bourdain and Somebody Feed Phil. I mean, he's, he's definitely well known. But he is this Tuscan butcher who cites who reads Dante or recites Dante aloud while he works and has some very specific methods and techniques and philosophies, but you can go to his restaurant and this would be another, this would be like a meal to make a reservation now. And you know, this is like a meal to like spend some money on okay. um, and eat in Panzano if you can get a reservation. If you can get a reservation, which is very possible because it's, it's well known. Uh, he has a couple of food trucks that are open on certain days of the week. I think like on the weekends, generally his food trucks are open. So you could still go to Panzano and eat at one of the trucks. And where is that? Uh, it's also in Tuscany. It's about, it's between Florence and South of Florence. Okay. Always hard to describe Tuscany. Usually if, if we weren't recording this, I'd pull up Google Maps. We would do a screen share together because it's it's kind of an orbit. <laughs> yeah. most, most stuff is south of Florence in general, but um, okay, yeah, it's between Florence and Montepulciano. It's a small town, and he's really the person that put it on the map. It's, okay. it's it wasn't a place that was famous before that. He uh, Tuscany, you know, olive oil, of course, is such a huge product in Tuscany. So I would. Consider a, an olive oil tasting. Oh, that's the other thing I forgot to mention in San Miniato. I was telling you about the Beccancini family. Also, there is very close to their property, a place called Truffle in Tuscany, uh, .com. It's among some of the rare Italians that are good at a website. <laughs> there's a lot of, there's a wonder, it breaks my heart. There's so many amazing providers and hosts and resources in Italy and so many bad websites. I've seen a few bad ones. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And like so many people, it's like, you just, you really cannot judge a web, a company by its website. You can't judge a book by its cover when it comes to Italy. In fact, sometimes a bad site website is indicative of a very good experience. <laughs> I always say this about Naples. This has changed in, in more recent years, but like, you know, like don't look for it all over Italy, really. Like don't look for the place that like has the red checkered tablecloth. Look for the place that has like one light bulb hanging on a wire. Okay. You know? <laughs> That's often the best place. But um, this, this truffle in Tuscany is a, a family that has been hunting truffles and they usually don't go to Tuscany for truffles that's more in Umbria or in Piemonte but they're in San Miniato there are black truffles and they have these wonderful dogs and I'm, I love dogs as evidenced by my dog whether squeaky toy and you go out you you get into this guy's Fiat Panda I mean you know it's like a don't wear anything nice that day you're gonna get covered in dirt he picks out one of the dogs for the day and you just go out for the in the woods and you go searching for truffles you may or may not find something. And then at the end, you go back to their property and his sister cooks you lunch and you just hang out and enjoy life. It's wonderful. That sounds great. <laughs> yeah. It's it's not, um, you know, it's a, an authentic experience. Like some of those things can be a little, you know, contrived. Right. But it's hard to know the difference between which one is going to be like that and which one isn't. When it's very hard. Yeah. And, and I think that's, you know, to circle back to what we were saying before about overwhelming information. There, and there are so many places in Italy that look so picturesque mm -hmm. and, and that, that get so much attention on Instagram and TikTok. And yeah, they, you know, it's not a false picture, but you know, it's not always the best experience. Sometimes the places right. that don't, you know, how a place feels is more important than how it looks. It's kind of like, you know, sometimes if you see a supermodel in real life, they look sort of strange because they're so tall and they're so angular. <laughs> Uh, you know, the same thing could be for some of these towns, like some of these places that look so dramatic and beautiful are actually very difficult to navigate or very hard to move around. Whereas some of these smaller towns, which maybe don't look as spectacular in a photograph, uh, are really, you know, full of wonderful people and a lot of soul. Right. So what else is on your wish list? What, what would be a coastal area that would be... Close. Yeah. Um, there's a beach town there called Talamoni. That, the thing, that, the, the problem, it's not really a problem, but in terms of going to the beach, Italians, like, don't go in the water after, like, the second. Well, not, not to go and lay on the beach, but just to be. 
to just see. Be on the coast. Okay, yeah, because like sometimes if you're looking for the Pacific Coast Highway in California, you know, you've got a really nice drive. You've got the ocean there. You've got the cliffs. Right. Yeah. Um, there is there is the coast in Tuscany. Uh, Via Reggio is like the the easiest, you know, sort of like closest to Florence. Uh, Telemoni is beautiful. But a lot of these places are kind of resort towns and they can be a little desolate in the off season. Um, two ideas for you. One is the island of Elba, which is... Mm -hmm. East, it's it's in the it's on the Tyrrhenian side west. Yeah, we're really looking at it on the map. Yeah, and it, Napoleon was exiled there for a while, and he escaped. So that's kind of the most the, the biggest claim to fame of Elba. It's beautiful. You get there by taking a ferry from the town of Piombino. Mm -hmm. um, it's spelled P I O M B I N O. Piombino is like an industrial port. I think there's a nice part of Piombino. I haven't seen it, but I remember the first time I went there, I saw this like giant, I don't know what it was, like an oil refinery. I was like, where am I going? And I don't want to swim in this water. But I'm <laughs> pretty sure, pretty soon you arrive in a really beautiful paradise. And that's a, that's a wonderful place and will be very affordable okay. in October. So you could probably get an apartment right on the beach, you know, VRBO, Airbnb, that kind of thing in Elba. Okay. The other place that is a that wouldn't just be like a day trip thing. You would think maybe it would be better to just go and stay for a day or two. I would stay there for a few days. You could do it as a day trip, depending on where you were based. Like if you were based closer to that area, but I, you know, if you want to make this one of the couple of places that you stay for three or four days, Elbow would be a fantastic choice. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then the other idea I have is the the far less traveled but truly spectacular Abruzzo which is would be southeast of Tuscany. And Abruzzo is a place where, I mean, Tuscany can be very expensive. People should need to be going to Abruzzo where the food is unbelievably good and people are really nice and there's mountains and coast and the coastline of Abruzzo is really beautiful. Okay. There are these things called um, trabocchi, which are like these like fishing huts that jut out into the sea and you can go have lunch of fresh fish right on one of these these huts uh, just really kind of, it's a, it's a region that's kind of wild. You know, when you, I thought of it when you were sort of describing that the Pacific coast highway of California, it's definitely sort of wild and rugged. The driving will be a little more challenging there in the mountains more so less so on the coast. This is a place Katie and I also know when you're ever, you're, whenever you're traveling Italy, frankly, no matter where you are, have a paper map in the glove box. <laughs> There are places where the GPS just goes on a coffee break. Take a look at your route. And the other thing the GPS always does that drives me nuts is sometimes, you know, to save you five minutes, it'll have you get off the highway to go mm -hmm. through some tiny village. But, you know, they don't tell you that the streets of the village are, you know, three feet wide. Mm -hmm. So, like, just always scan your route ahead of time and say, you know what, we'll stay on the highway and we'll, we're fine, you know, spending that extra 10 minutes on the road. Okay. <laughs> If you, certainly if you go to Abruzzo, that, that advice applies double, but it's definitely very rewarding. I know a family that's there right now. Um, I think they thought they were going to Tuscany or originally. They had they have some family in Europe who sort of put it all together and they're in Abruzzo and they, they're just posting pictures every day. Like we had no idea. We didn't even know what this place was beforehand, but it is paradise. It needs to be on far more many people's radar. And, you know, one of, one of my soapboxes is, is if you are, especially if you're a budget traveler, there's so many beautiful places in Italy and you got to stop going to right. the big cities. You got to stop going to Cinque Terre, the Malfi Coast. You've got to explore all these wonderful other places. In Italy. Cinque Terre on my do not go list because I kept seeing all these people saying, this is horrible. It's like Disneyland. There's so many people here. I thought, yeah, yeah. I don't and think it's, I here. <laughs> it's a beautiful place, no doubt, but I just feel yeah. like it's just too crowded right now. It's just, it's, that's just the simple answer. There's just, there are people. people there. That's it. Yeah. What were some of the other places you had on your list? I remember there was a few others that I'm. Um, the screen is open. I can't see. Uh, there was a couple of wineries. You might have mentioned it already at C I A R L I A N A, Ciarliana. That one I'm not familiar with. Okay. Um, 
Montepulciano, I had mm -hmm. that on my list. Um, and then a whole bunch of ones that I can't pronounce. Sienna, P-E-R-U-G-I-A. Perugia. Perugia is mm -hmm. a beautiful city, yeah. Perugia is in the region of Umbria, and it is um, a university town. It's a cool college town. Okay. Really yeah. beautiful. Do you have other wineries to recommend? Absolutely. You, you want me to bring in the wine guy for some wineries? For sure. <laughs> bring, bring in a, another person. <laughs> All right, hold on. He's gone. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> this is my husband, Christian Galliani. <laughs> Hello. Hello. So nice he's to meet you. Talking. Thanks for joining. <laughs> my pleasure. Always happy to consult. Yeah. So if you're looking uh, for a new experience as far as wine goes, uh, she mentioned, and Danielle mentioned uh, Pietro Beponcini, but depending upon how, um, how sort of user-friendly of an experience you want versus how rustic you want is going to dictate which wineries uh, are best for your trip. So I'll give you an example. If you're really into the wine, right, the very best of the Montepulciano in Abruzzo is going to be, without a doubt, Emilio Pepe. Oh, yeah, you should go to Emilio Pepe. So Emilio Pepe yeah. is <laughs> very tip top of Abruzzese wine. You know, that's like their first growth. That's like their, think like the Lafitte Rothschild of Abruzzo, and that's them. And it's still rustic enough where the old man still putters around and the daughter really runs things now. But the wine is spectacular and it's not inexpensive, right? You're going to pay somewhere around 50 euro for the tasting, but it is without a doubt the best wine you'll have in the okay. region. And if you were going to buy one of those bottles here, it would be oh, really forget expensive. It. Yeah. Okay. You know, relative to what you're going to pay. And that's, that's sort of my claim to fame is finding stuff that's kind of that hidden gem. I'm cheap, you know, <laughs> truth be told, I, it pains me to pay $50 for a bottle of wine when I know I can spend $10 for something that I know is just as good, just doesn't have as fancy of a pedigree. Right. But I have to say, Emilio Pepe is the best winery within driving distance that you're going to experience for the money. Okay. And you can lunch there and right. they'll take you through the vineyard, depending upon you know how much detail you want to know about it, etc. Either way, it's always a great time. It's a trip of a lifetime there. Yeah, that would be a really special place. You know, I mean, obviously there's great wine all over Tuscany, but that would be like a really special destination. Right. And I believe they have rooms that you can stay there. They do. Yeah, they do. In fact, and mm -hmm. also, if we're talking, if we're gonna be in <laughs> uh, sorry, we didn't hear that. What was that? That, that would be good because we wouldn't have to drive after the tasting. <laughs> exactly. Good thinking. Thanks. Right. Yeah. So there's that, and if you're going to be in Umbria, uh, you can say the same thing um, about Paolo Bea. Paolo Bea's winery is sort of just spectacular. But if you don't feel like spending Paolo Bea money, they have lots of different other uh, vineyards just right around Perugia, which we'll include in the email, which I think are spectacular. I'm writing this down so I can send you this information later because I actually don't know how to spell Bea. So. B E A. Okay, that's it. All right, easy enough. <laughs> and in Tuscany, you know, you're going to have lots of, you know, that's that's sort of the epicenter for wine enotourism in Italy. So you're going to have lots of tourist traps. Right. So the best thing to remember is either if you want to have the sort of Napa experience, go to Bonfi, right? Bonfi right. is uh, started by a, an Italian-American family uh, from Long Island, ironically. They went and they uh, opened up a vineyard in uh, Tuscany and they have just a fantastic sort of user experience when you get there. Yeah, so well, that's super well organized for tourism, and yeah. it's a beautiful place, and they have events. Yeah, yeah. so that's, that's an easy. That's like if you don't want to think at all, go to Bonfi. Exactly. If you want to like really hang out with somebody's one-eyed cat and get to know their family and exactly. get drunk and eat some of the best cheese, we have such good cheese there. Oh, spectacular! Like this amazing pecorino. Then you go to Becconcini, exactly. and, and you know, and then you'll be like hanging out in the room where they like dry the grapes for the Vin Santo. So you should do both, actually. You should try <laughs> you should both. Do. You should take the uh, take the Pepsi challenge, so to speak, and yeah. see which experience you like better. Okay. That's that's a really um, – Beconcini is fantastic because it's offbeat, 
but they are up for the Trebicchietti, which is the wine of Italy for their Samignato, for their Marleo. So this is a serious winery. It's a wolf in sheep clothing. So we don't mean to, you know, just start to like create information overwhelm for you once again. So <laughs> just to like sum this up, I'm going to put all these things together. And as long as you're writing it down, it's yeah, good. Yeah, we'll put all these things together in a cogent way. So It'll all make sense. It will all make it. sense. And when you look at it also on the map, then you can strategize as to right. exactly where you want to be. But I think the overall idea here, which I try to do with any itinerary, whether it's my own or for somebody else, is like to balance out those cool, local, rustic mom and pop places with some like really nice experiences because you're on vacation. So you should have some nights where you dress up and do something really special. Yeah. We are up for a special dinner. I a would couple, I, yes. I would want to spring for the 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 winery that you recommended, the immediate uh, Pepe. Pepe, yeah. But then also like they don't all have to be epic, you know, because we're not like we like wine, but we're certainly not connoisseurs. We're not necessarily in it to have the most amazing wine I ever tasted, but you know, yeah. That would be a plus. <laughs> I mean but yeah. also, too, like, not only is this just about enjoyment, but like, you get to learn something and take exactly. take that home with you. Right. And you know, that's why I'm always such an advocate too. For a lot of times, people like, you know, they're overwhelmed and they go, "Well, what are the best things?" And you know, the best things are going to be things that you can dig into, mm -hmm. and that can become interests long after your trip is over. You know, like just find something that has the kernel of an interest or maybe a slight fascination. Anything that has the potential to become a fascination. Go to Italy and experience it where you will find the masters and then you you come home with a new, you know, insight, a new experience and something else to pursue that will hopefully make your life richer. For sure. The okay. Italian passion comes through in everything. Yeah. Do. Hopefully this won't be our only trip. So. I think yeah. But, but I also I mean, I want to see it, but I don't want to spend a lot of time driving everywhere to. Yeah. see things because when we went to ireland it was like oh we're going to see the whole country when we got there and they were like well do you <laughs> want to see the whole country or do you want to see the people and it was like yeah we need to spend two or three days and maybe a half day going to another city and then be able to establish again so right right we had more fun in places we stayed more than one day so we we did learn that for sure well i think with this you can do you have a decent amount of time I would maybe pick like three locations where you spend three or four nights. Right. You know, something coastal, mm -hmm. Elba or the coast of Abruzzo, mm -hmm. um, someplace right in central Tuscany. And then some, I mean, you might want to stay in the city for a night or two if there are, you know, one or two museums you want to do or you want to go, out, you know, do any sort of city activities, any shopping, that sort of thing. Uh, but yeah, when I put this all together for you, I think then you'll probably yeah. make your decision. We had thought if we, or I had thought if we flew into Florence that maybe we would stay there for a night or two just to sort of get your bearings and catch up on your sleeve or whatever before we headed out. So, yeah, Florence is, you know, yeah. a jewel. It's an absolute treasure. It was way cheaper than we might be doing that in Rome. I don't know. <laughs> we haven't looked at prices on tickets yet. So, we don't know. Well, I did, but. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm fine with air fare. <laughs> Good. Any other questions, challenges, anything else you want to talk about that is weighing on you as you plan this trip? No, and I've just been deep diving into the, you know, don't check a bag and all that stuff, like what to take. And so, yeah, I, I, you know, this, this summer in particular has been challenging for mostly for people that are doing transfers you're able, if you're able to do a direct flight from the United States, so say for example, you fly from Knoxville to New York and then you go direct, right? then bring your, you don't need to carry, just to carry on only. Yeah. <laughs> um, people that are transferring at like Charles de Gaulle or Frankfurt are having trouble with lost luggage. However, I think that this summer has been just an overwhelming amount of tourism. You know, there's so little for two years and then so much and Europe is having all the same pro problems we are having with staffing and inflation, and fuel prices. Um, so I think, you know, you got to take an extra bag, take an extra bag. Like, don't worry about that. I would love to be one of those people that could just go with a carry on. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I don't do that. Um, I, 
always keep a change of clothes, a toothbrush, some clean underwear in your carry-on so that if your flight is delayed, you have something. But, you know, Italy's got great shopping. You have to go right. back to the outfits. Not the worst thing in the world. <laughs> I lost my luggage. <laughs> Yeah, obviously, you know, important things, medication, eyeglasses, all that stuff, you know, put that in your carry on always, no matter what. But I don't think you should. Feel, I feel I know a lot of people have said that they're like, I feel so like I'm so terrorized by people on message boards that say I can only bring a carry on. I'm like, do what you need to do. Don't worry about that. And the same goes for for money belts. And, you know, certainly there's been a lot of pickpocket. There's always, always a lot of pickpocketing in the big touristy destinations. But carry yourself as you would in any major city. Mm -hmm. the world um italy's you know not a dangerous country overall so no. just use caution and and i don't think it's it, common it, sense. i don't think it warrants a, a really heightened level and you know i know for somebody somebody that's been pickpocketed they'll you know get very upset when i say that and i understand it's a terrible feeling of being violated but i don't know i we're new yorkers so i guess we just have a normal sense of vigilance around our bags <laughs> And it's just common sense, right? I mean, if you're in a crowd of people, you know, chances are something yeah. something is yeah. going to happen to someone somewhere. But it's just I don't keep we're not it. particularly afraid of that sort of thing. I think we're aware enough. Yeah. So where where did you guys go together as a couple that was probably would you say the best or the most meaningful or memorable place that you've been together in Italy? Wow. <laughs> we got a lot. So every time we yeah. go, we, something must come to mind. Well, it depends. You know, my first, uh, Danielle lived in Florence uh, for a year. So I, when I was able to see it with her for the first time as an adult and walk around, the last time I'd been to Florence was prior to last year, was when I was 12 years old. And we did the, uh, as we affectionately referred to it, in my family, the Florentine Death March with my father, rest in peace, who dragged us around Florence right. in August. Don't want to do that. No air conditioning, and we finally stopped for dinner at the last, you know, pizzeria that was open at ten o'clock. So mm -hmm. I had had negative feelings about uh, Florence prior to that. So when I was able to see it as an adult, with you know, the mind of an adult, mm -hmm. and I had lived there, so I, I knew it there. extremely well. So you know, was able to just. Around. That yeah. was sort of that was sort of a perspective changer for me because being in the food and wine world, I got to have one of the best meals of my life at Tostanza. Mm -hmm. I had I was able to do a deep dive into Tuscan wine and pay Tuscan prices as opposed to paying American prices. And I was able to see, you know, the city where, you know, if you drop Leonardo today, he could find his way home. Um, that was especially meaningful to me. Right. And then, I don't know, I mean, we always, we our tours are in the south of Italy. I feel like every time we go to Naples, even though we've been there many times, we just always, like, we have this, like, but, like, life, it's so rich. Amazing. Why do we worry about anything? Life is beautiful. <laughs> so. Well, there was a time that I cried when I had the pizza in Pompeii, and she took the picture of me. <laughs> I want to cry over pizza. <laughs> You gotta go south for that. Yeah, Maybe next, you your next yeah. trip, you'll go south, and we'll, we'll tell you where you can cry. Okay, with. so... I'm seeing uh, what looks like a lake just straight south of Rezo. And it's kind of like tucked in the mountains, it looks like. Uh, well, that would be a bunch. Let me see if I can pull up Google Maps quickly here and take it. It's like Lake Trezimeno. Oh, Trezimeno. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's most famous for um, Hannibal, the, the, the military general Hannibal during the, in ancient Rome trekking a bunch of elephants across Lake Trasimeno and apparently they're drowned there. <laughs> but that's not why I'd be going to see. Yeah, that is that is also a, a beautiful area and there are places along the lake where you can stay and for sure off the beaten path. Okay. Katie, do you have any advice for Trasimeno? Mm, no, no, we just, we didn't stop there. We well, I've been in the area recently, we didn't stop there because we were on a you know, hot date. We had a hot date with Deborah in Arezzo, <laughs> but um, yeah, no, we didn't stop there. And actually, some friends of ours that live in um, Gubbio in that have been on the podcast, uh, Sal and Sarah, up in the hills in Umbria, they sort of were like, because we were thinking of going there, and they said, no, 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 go to Gubbio, you'll love that more. And yeah. uh, we did love Gubbio, actually. Gubbio is a really lovely town in Umbria that you, know, you can probably reach from the Arezzo area quite easily. It's a, maybe mm -hmm. a little bit of a longer day trip, but it's a beautiful medieval town. And it sort of, I can compare it to maybe 
uh, a re- like San Gimignano, but no crowds. Yes, <laughs> like it's really- exactly. I, in fact, yes, if you don't want to go, if you want to go to San Gimignano, but you don't want crowds, go to Gubbio. That's excellent advice. And mm-hmm. I would also recommend the city of Urbino, which is not far mm-hmm. from Gubbio. Yeah. And these Urbino. are all drivable from, say, Arezzo, right? Yeah, yeah. In yeah. fact, I remember in, when I was in graduate school, we did a day trip where we went from Arezzo to Gubbio to Urbino all in one afternoon. We were ambitious, but we did it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. In Gubbio, you can get these really cute little, uh, well, they're cute. I, I'm really terrified of heights, so this was actually terrifying for me. But they're like little bird cages that go up to the top of the mountain. And um, up there you can go to a church and you can see the mummified remains of Montebaldo. <laughs> but um, unfortunately for my family, this this. I'm really terrified of heights. Okay, so this bird cage, lovely bird cage, uh, chairlift thing, um, I refuse to go back down in it. So I made them all walk down the mountain. So I think my family's going to have a similar experience with Gubbio as you did with Florence Christian. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be their memory. They're going to be on a podcast talking about in 30 years. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> No, Gubbio okay. is beautiful, and all of these hill towns too. I mean, it's, they're so rich in medieval history. I mean, it, it feels very Assassin's Creed, very Game of Thrones. And so, you know, definitely medieval history. You might want to read some Ken Follett books before you go on this trip, because the medieval history is really interesting. And and some of these villages. I mean, it really feels like time is stood still. Gubbio is one of those, you know, just surrounded by stone walls and so ancient, and yet modern life is still going on inside of it. Right. Sounds perfect. Yeah. All right. Any other last questions? Anything else? Uh, I think we're good. No. After we hang up, I'll probably have a whole lot. But right now, <laughs> I feel like we covered a good bit. Good. Well, like I said, I'll send you a document tomorrow. I'll type all this up. And then if you have any other questions, you can just feel free to shoot me back an email. Okay. Okay. All right. Katie, you have anything else to add? Oh, no, I just thought it was so wonderful just, you know, having, as you know, I've just spent uh, two weeks in Umbria and Tuscany myself. And, you know, look, there's so many new things to discover. I just want to go back to Tuscany again. Thanks, Danielle. <laughs> Luckily, I'm not going to be, well, don't have too long to wait. But, uh, yeah, it's just, you know, one thing I really want to stress to everyone that's listening is that you can't find so many places on the internet. And, Danielle mentioned this before, but they, they're terrible at marketing the Italians. So if you really want um, to find places that are different or unique or really special, then you really need to tap into someone like Danielle because you won't find it otherwise. I mean, it's kind of one of my pet peeves when people say, just Google it because you can't. The people that are, you know, the pages that are ranking high on Google are actually people that know how to rank on Google <laughs> and um, being quite good at that myself, um, I know that it's, you know, like it's an actual skill. So it doesn't necessarily mean that the activity is great or the advice is great. It just means they know how to write to rank on Google. So please, everyone, you know, make sure you tap into amazing advice like Danielle's so that you can find all these wonderful, wonderful places. Okay, thank you, Laura and Ed, for joining us live and sharing your travel plans. And thank you, Danielle and Christian, for your amazing insight. And Danielle, if listeners would like to tap into your knowledge, how can they organise a trip planning session with you? Just go to feasttravel.com and you can click on the um, tab that says that says trip consultation. And then I've got a few different options. I've got stuff for people that are just thinking about a trip, especially thinking ahead to 2023. And given how crowded it's been this year, definitely start thinking about 2023 now. Uh, I have another service for people who have their itineraries well planned and they just want somebody who's actually going to tell them the exact tour guides, the exact restaurants they should eat. And then we also have services for people who don't want to do anything and we'll do everything for you <laughs> So, <laughs> while they're on the website. Oh, great. Yeah. Thank you, Danielle. Thank you to Laura and Ed and all our listeners and watchers for joining us today. I hope you're now inspired to travel a little deeper into Tuscany, Umbria and Abruzzo and discover all its hidden and untold corners. Ciao for now, everyone. See you next time. Ciao. See you.